Well, hello everyone. This is Al-Fadi and I want to welcome you back to this particular series about Mecca, which is really, uh, you know, a continuation of our search for facts that corroborate the standard Islamic narrative when it comes to Mecca, geographically, archaeologically speaking, historically speaking, and the list can go on and on and on. Today, we're going to take uh, another step at this by looking at the many borrowed rituals, Islamic rituals, that are usually actually practiced by our Muslim friends during one of the most important pillars, which is the pilgrimage, which is the fifth pillar out of the five pillars of Islam. And of course, with me here to unpack all of this, as always, Dr. Jay Smith. Dr. Jay, thank you again uh, for joining us. And, uh, you know, it's been a fascinating series, I think, judging by the comments and the interactions we've been receiving uh, from people who are watching this. Uh, it's uh, You can tell that people are actually excited about all of this new information and some of it even, uh, you know, info that demands, you know, asking questions and even Googling when we did it about the Zamzam well. But what is it about these stages of the uh, pilgrimage that you wanted to address? Well, I'm just going to look at the Hajj itself and look at the five stages of the Hajj. Uh, some of this material has been introduced already. We've done it in a previous series, uh, but we introduced Dan Gibson's uh, hypothesis, and he uh, his hypothesis starts from the premise that all of these five stages are can be uh, the antecedents of them can be found in Petra. So let's go, go up on the screen and we'll just keep looking at the screen because I want to just look through each one of these step by step by step and I want to get your reactions. This is the first time you're going to hear this from me. Let's go ahead and start with the Kaaba itself. Now that's the picture of the Kaaba. That's that. Uh, let me just get my pointer up here. Well, the, the the black thing right there, that's the Kaaba. We want to look at that black building. And that's the what everybody prays to that's uh, right. five times a day. It doesn't matter where they are in the world, they have to pray to that building. That's and right. that building was supposedly, according to tradition, it was constructed by or reconstructed uh, uh, from its ruins by Abraham and, and Ishmael, Ishmael. That's while correct. Ishmael was still living before he was thrown out into the desert. So that was, what, 1900 B.C., 18, 1900 B.C. We're talking about almost 2,000, uh, 4,000 years ago that that, has, that that building supposedly this. Now, what's interesting, our good friend uh, Dan Gibson said, oh, no, no, wait, you can find also a Kaaba here. Now, there's been some there's some, been some feedback from people saying that he's got the wrong Kaaba. I'm not going to go with that so much. I'm I'm just gonna showing the theory that's out there. Dan Gibson said, said that that's the original Kaaba, and that's in Petra. What is interesting is when you go down to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. Paul Ellis, that we had uh, in our, our uh, live, live stream, stream yeah. that we had there on the 20th of December, back uh, in 2021, he actually has put together the whole Jerusalem thesis, and he is saying, hold on a minute, there is an original Kaaba, because Kaaba actually means cube, and uh, that comes from Hebrew, and there was a cube, and that cube is there on the Temple Mount, which is right here, where is the Dome of the Rock today? Today, if you look at Jerusalem, there is the Dome of the Rock. That is sitting over top what used to be the original Kaaba, the Jewish Kaaba. Okay. Even the word Kaaba in Hebrew is the same word. It was also square. And that's where the temple was built by David. And that's where they would circumambulate. And which way would they circumambulate around that? They would do it counterclockwise. How many times? Seven times. When you went and did the Hajj there at in Kaaba in Mecca, which way did you go when you circumambulated? Uh, also uh, counter, counterclockwise. You know, but in all around the times. world, in every yeah. other tradition, everybody goes clockwise except in Islam. Where do you think Islam got that from? It got it from Jerusalem. It got it from the Jews. The Jews circumambulated. And why seven times? Who did seven times around? The story of Joshua. The story of Joshua around Jericho seven right. times, circumambulating. That's, right. That's where it comes from. So this comes straight out of Judaism. It comes straight out of the Temple Mount. It comes straight out of Jerusalem. That's the original Kaaba from which this has now been created. It's basically re redoing or borrowed what the Jews already did there in Jerusalem. They are now doing here in Mecca. Yeah. So there's the first one. And, and David Gibson also mentioned that some of these appear to have been an altar, actually. So they have some steps leading up to them. And it appears that this act by Jew, uh, the Jews is to commemorate, you know, uh, what happened in Jericho. To commemorate exactly what yeah. happened in Jericho. That's the reason behind it. Mm -hmm. You ask a Muslim why they do those seven times. I've yet to see a Muslim explain that. Well, we're explaining it for them. What does it say in chapter 10, verse 94 of the Quran? What does it say in chapter 21, verse 7? If you have any question, 
Go to the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, because they have been given the Taurat, which right. is the story in the Torah, the story mm -hmm. of this very event in Joshua. And there it is in the Torah. So come back to us. We'll tell you, and we'll actually show you that's the original Kabbalah right down there. Now, that's just the first stage, okay? Let's go to the second one. And this is probably the more exciting one, because when you go to Mecca, remember we said uh, a, a number of episodes ago that after you go to Mecca and you do the circumambulation, what do you do next? You then go to the Safa and Marwa. And what exactly? Explain that again for people. Well, I mean, the Safa and Marwa, the idea, at least from a standard Islamic narrative, is that there are two mountains, and uh, somehow Hagar had her uh, baby child, uh, Ishmael, who was thirsty. She was looking for water, as, of course, any mother would panic when she, you see your son basically dying from thirst. So she would go up uh, the top of the mountain. And obviously, if you ever lived in a desert or been to a desert, you can see a mirage. And, and the idea is that she would see a mirage, get excited, think in its water. So she would run towards it because she's excited about that. Uh, come to find out that it was just a mirage, getting disappointed, goes to the top of that mountain, looks the other way. The same thing happened, and she did it seven times. Interestingly, by the seventh time, finally, a will kind of like appeared to her. And that's what we call the will of Zemzem. But that's a whole different story. Which we talked now. about in a But that's the episode. reason why you go between the two. By the way, if you've ever been to Mecca, uh, I mean, I'm assuming if you're a Muslim, obviously non-Muslims cannot go there. Uh, please tell me, do you really see two mountains or just a couple of piles of rocks? Look at it. There's it right there. Yeah. How big a gene that is? How tall do you think that is? It's not that tall. I mean, you can climb it. Some kids About use 20 to, feet to high. play there. You know, that's why they fenced off. That does not look like a mountain to me. Does that look like a mountain? That is about the same side. There's the two, Safa and Marwa, yeah. that you run back and forth between a mountain? We're talking about a rock, a big a, a big rock, yes. I don't want to be yeah, have yeah. that fall on top yeah, of me. Yeah. But that is nothing more than a rock that kids can climb on. That's why they have to put these barricades around because kids were climbing That's right. on it. That's right, yeah. Not something you'd be looking for water from. And especially if you go to that rock and not find it, you go to that rock and not find it, you go, what are you going to do in going back and forth seven times? Obviously, if you didn't find it the first time, you'd stop going there because it's just nothing more than a rock. That would not either. She's not very intelligent or something here is wrong with the story. I would suggest that something's wrong with the story because in the Bible, it is mountains. These are mountains. Now, Dave, Dan Gibson decided, well, these are probably the Safa and Maru that we're referring to because these are referred to there in Petra. But I think there's even a better answer. And this is where Mel has really helped us. That's and right. also Paul and Odin, both Mel, Paul, all three of them have said, hold on a minute. Unpack it a little bit further. Go further back. What is the Arabic word for Marwa? It is Moraya. Sorry, right. the Arabic word for Moraya is Marwa. Marwa is the Arabization of the word Moraya. What is Moraya? It's the name of a mountain. What mountain? It's the where the Dome of the Rock is today. Right. That is Mount the mountain. Yeah. Mount Moriah, where Abraham, Abraham went to sacrifice. Gonna, exactly, and Jesus was. Isaac, was right? And so position. that's why it is considered, that's why the temple was built there. That's, that's why right. all the Jews would go there. There's Mount Moriah right there. It's right there on the in Jerusalem where the Dome of the Rock was built, but that was built in 691 A.D., Mm -hmm. The temple, which is much older, of course, it was from B.C., it was always there for that reason to commemorate where Abraham sat, was to sacrifice mm -hmm. Isaac. What about Safa? Well, you need to go to Josephus. In the first century, Josephus refers to Marwa and Safa. He's referring to Mount Moriah and Mount Scopus. Mm -hmm. Scopus, the Arabization for Scopus is Safa. So where is Mount Scopus? There it is right there, where I'm pointing to, where that green circle is. That is Mount Scopus. This is the Kidron Valley. You go there today and you will see that's Mount Scopus. This is Moriah. That's where the Jews would go back and forth seven times. Down to the Kidron Valley, back up to Mount Scopus, down to the Kidron Valley, back up to Moriah. Why? To commemorate Hagar looking for water. It's nothing more than commemoration, but those are mountains. Those aren't little rocks that are 15 feet high or 20 feet high like you see over here. Can you see? That makes sense. So it looks like that which you have here is nothing more than a facsimile of what was originally there. And this is what they've been doing for thousands of years. So can you see, again, another borrowing, even the names are borrowed. Mm -hmm. Safa and Marwa are originally in Jerusalem. Right. Now, this one here is, to, we're still looking for it, the Hill of Ararat. You've been to the Hill of Ararat. It's there in Mecca. You can see it. That's where they explain. What I think you're talking about Arafat. Should I say Ararat? I yeah. meant Arafat, you're yeah. right. Uh, the, the Arafat uh, one is basically the mount of, uh, you know, uh, it's it's like the, the mountain where Adam and Eve got united, okay? Why? Because after the fall, supposedly they were separated from each other on earth, 
and they start to look for each other and they found each other by in this area known as Arafat where they reunited and met each other once again. Do you know where Adam was actually thrown to? India. Exactly. Kerala, yeah. which is the very yeah. southern tip of India. And according to traditions, he was 90 feet tall and he strode 90 feet striding across thousands of miles to get all the way up to Mecca to find his wife, Eve. Either God's inept or whoever threw him down did not, did not know how to aim very well because he, <laughs> poor guy, he had to walk, he had to create strides that were equivalent to a 90 foot, foot tall person striding all the way up to Mecca and then meeting her here. Now, did he suddenly diminish in size when he got here? Do you know, have anybody asked that question before? Yeah, I mean, it, it appears that he did. Nonetheless, you that's where they all go to and you all, you did that. You've been there to Arafat. Now, what's interesting, Dan Gibson says that this is the Arafat because this is named Arafat in Petra. So there is an Arafat in Petra. This story doesn't exist anywhere. We don't have the story in Judaism for one good reason. Abraham and I and and uh, Adam and Eve, excuse me, Adam and Eve were never thrown down to earth because the Garden of Eden in the Taurit, in the Genesis account, is already on earth. Right. God would not throw them out, and he certainly would not have made such a clumsy mess of it by separating them by thousands of miles. So let's go to the next one, and this is what's fascinating to me. This is the Jamarats. The Jamarats are explained this. What are these Jamarats? Well, I mean, again, it has to do with Abraham and Abrahamic story. We know from the biblical narrative that Abraham took his son, obviously, initially, even Islamic sources said the son was Isaac. Later, it was reinterpreted to be Ishmael, regardless. So he took him in a three-day journey, and the, uh, you know, the allegation is that Satan would try to entice him every day, and he would stone Satan. Amazingly, he would stone him seven times. So every pillar, there are three pillars— Jamarat meaning the ones that you throw with the rocks. Every pillar represents one of those days and one of those incidents. And that's what Muslims will do in the last three days uh, after the celebration of Al-Adha, basically. I am smiling for a very good reason. Yeah. You are a young man. Yeah. You're not as old as I am. That's right. I've got gray hair. You don't remember that prior to 1980, there were not three Jamarats. How was, many Jamarats There was were one there? only. There was only one. Yeah. You now have just told me a new tradition. Well, here's why they, they widen him and uh, spread him out because of how crowded it can get. Bingo. Yeah. Hold on a minute. So in uh, prior to 1980, if you look at every picture of the Masjid al-Haram, if you look at every picture of Mecca prior to 1980, you will only find one Jamarat, right? It was a small crowd. Small crowds. Yeah. Which means there's only one devil. You and come back to it three times. Basically. Three times. Yeah. And you throw stones at it. Yeah. So now it's not even three times, but now it's become three times because the crowds are so large. Right. So now they have erected one, two, three. That has been in more. That's that's the most re recent rendition. Right. Now they have to change the narrative because now they have such big crowds. They've got to say, well, it's not just one devil. It's actually three different seductions of the devil. Right. So the narrative has changed in just 40 years during your lifetime. Yeah. But if you ask your dad and your grandparents, what were, how many devils were there or how many times was it? It's always just once. Yeah, I mean, they can come back at you and say, well, yeah, it's one, but we do it three times. One every day. And now it's yeah. become three different uh, seductions. Right. But see that, look and see any book that read, says it's three different times prior to 1980. See if yeah. you can find that. Sure. So even you have been brought up with this new narrative. That means the narrative is changing in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. If the narrative is changing in our lifetime, why are we so surprised that it didn't change between the 7th century, 8th and 9th century? That's correct. When this was all written down in the 9th and 10th century, can you see if in 40 years where we can even corroborate it and it's happening in our lifetime, it gets changed? Because in this case, there are such huge crowds, they have to build another two. They have to create a new narrative for it. Why then are we not surprised that this was also being changed between the 7th, 8th and 9th century when they didn't have lexographs and they didn't have papers or they didn't have videos that they could go back and check on it. That's what to me is shows exactly what Islam is. It creates a new narrative depending on the needs. In this case, the needs of crowd control. But when you go back to Petra, you will find the Jamrat that Dan Gibson found, there was only one. Right. Only one. Now let's then go to the next one, and that is the Zamzam well. Now we spent quite a bit of time on this well. Correct. This is a, a picture of it from the 1950s, 1950s, I think it's from 1953 to be exact. So this is a picture of it. It's not a very deep well, is it? 
I mean, no. I mean, at least uh, from the picture also alone, you can see that it did not go, uh, I mean, consider going all the way down to get water that will be enough to feed or, uh, you know, quench the thirst of millions of pilgrims across the, throughout the year, basically. It, it's not that deep. And we do know that uh, you have here the wells in Petra, and David Dan Gibson says that this is probably the original of that story. We now know that actually the Zumzum well actually originated in Jerusalem. You can go back and you can see, and this is what Mel brought out in one of his episodes. He said, when you look and see there in the Temple Mount, that all the blood from all the sacrifices had to be washed away. And what was uh, what was washed away was the Zumzum, the Zumzum water that was used. That to wash it away, here is, I just have a picture of uh, Siloam. That is not where the Zumzum well is. It's the only picture I could find for the moment at the moment because I need to get this up. I'm running. Almost every one of these traditions we're going to shut down in a few months because I'm going to show you that there is actually an original one. There's actually an original Jamarad. There's actually an original Kaaba. There's actually an original Safan Mar. We're going to show you that there's actually an original for all of these that I'm not willing to do right yet. But I want to end with one more thing. I want to end with one more thing. You notice I've kept this blank here. Why do you think I've kept this blank? Because I want to talk about this. Because you kept the best for last. The best for last. And yeah. what am I showing here? What's going the on? The black here? stone. What is that? This is the black stone. Okay, hold on a minute. That doesn't look black. It looks silver to me. Uh, well, that's the encasement, but... Uh, you know, people assume that the black side inside is the black stone, when in fact it's just pieces put together, actually. Actually, it's three little pebbles that used to be a stone. They're only about the size of a coin, each one of them. They're very right. small. What you're looking at is tar, mostly. Yeah. You don't know the story to this, do you? But when you were growing up, you had to kiss that, didn't you? Oh, I touch it and kiss it uh, simply because the prophet commanded us, or at least uh, did it himself. Wait a minute. Uh, why would you kiss it? Why did the prophet ask you to kiss um, it? What's the reason that your parents gave you? Or what's the reason you heard when you were there? In the, the, the tradition says that this used to be whiter than snow and it turned black because of the sin of mankind. So it forgives your sin. It takes away your sin. If you follow the commands of the prophets and his rituals, uh, I mean his model. Yeah. yeah. Take that one step further. Think that yeah. through. What does this mean? Of course, what does this mean? Do you have a stone able to forgive sins? Yeah. I mean, if you look at all of this, Every single one of these pictures has a stone associated with it. And uh -huh. if you don't do it, your sins won't be forgiven. This is the pilgrimage where you hope that by the time you finish, you have no sins left in so you. So you're circumambulating the stone here. Right. You're actually going to run back and forth between the two stones, two stones here. You're going to a mountain full of stones over here. You have stones that you throw at these That's pillars. Stone, yeah. I'm not sure what the stone is in this case, but certainly the stone It's coming here, out of stone, you know. This is the one that really bothers me the most because this stone... So forgive sins. I thought that's only what God can do. That is true. Unless Satan took the fact that Jesus is our cornerstone and turned this to a stone with this illusion. You're now getting into scriptural and biblical yeah. material. I'm talking about Islam. Yeah. How yeah. can Islam have a stone for giving sins if that is only, the, it's only something God can do? Is that not committing shirk right there? Of course. I mean, this is why I'm pointing out to this, and I'm glad you put these pictures, because visual is helpful. These are what I call the stones of Islam. Every single Muslim watching this, please help us understand, how can you claim that the religion of Islam came to fight idolatry and shirk associating something with God? Please help us look at these pictures and tell us for yourself. Can you be a Muslim without touching a stone, kissing a stone, throwing a stone, and going around a stone or running between stones. You tell me. Everything that is at the root of Islam is based on idolatry. And yet Muslims are the first to say we have committed shirk by elevating, we, he thinks we have elevated a man to the position of God. I would suggest everything we know about Islam, all these five stages are all to do with idolatry. Talk about shirk. This is as idolatrous as you can get. And this is at the very center of Islam. This is on the eastern corner of the Hajj itself. This is the holiest place in Islam. It is what all the Muslims are to pray to five times a day. It's what every Muslim wants to get to. If you look at the crowd here, they're all pushing each other to get to the stone. They have to have policemen there to keep them back so that they don't crowd each other out, so that everybody can kiss the stone so they can get their sins forgiven. This is absolutely a contradiction in terms. This is as idolatrous as you can get. And this is the seat of Islam. It is all based on a stone. We need to unpack the stone. Hold on. Yep. We're going to be doing that. Look and see what we're going to find about this stone. 
But can you precede now? Almost everything we know has been borrowed from other sources. Right. And what's interesting, they've taken that which is borrowed from other sources and they have bastardized it again. They have ruined everything that these stand for. We can have to, we're going to have to do that in the next, when the next episode is coming up. We're going to show you in almost every case what they have done with what was beautiful and what was pure, they have made impure. But that's coming up. That's for yet a whole nother series of episodes. Until yeah. this time, we do want to conclude, and we'll do that next. Absolutely. You know what, brother? I feel stone cold, so I'm going to get my coffee on a rock right now. Everyone, you've heard the man. We have a concluding episode to wrap this thing up, but we look forward for 2022 also to have more video series on this and other topics that will continue to widen the holes of the narrative. Until then, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.